Hi, everybody. Ooh, sorry. Sorry. Um, good to see you out tonight. Uh, and welcome to the uh, final event of our 2019 Life of a Poet series uh, here at the Hill Center. Um, thanks to Laura and uh, Diana and Charlotte and everyone at the Hill Center. And uh, special thanks to Ron Charles um, for making this series so special. Ron kicked off our, yes, come on. It's Ron Charles. Ron and I are in matching gray federal suits today, and I don't know what that means. Um, Ron kicked off our sixth season, which is this season, uh, last September with an amazing event featuring Carmen Jimenez-Smith, and we hope she wins it big tonight at the National Book Awards. Uh, and I can't think of a better way to follow that event than with tonight's uh, Life of a Poet featuring Reginald Dwayne Betts who has had quite the tour, um, even just in DC. Uh, he's been all around the city uh, 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 in support of this book. Before we begin, I would like to tell you a little bit about the Poetry and Literature Center at the Library of Congress. We are home to the US Poet Laureate, uh, and our new Poet Laureate, Jerharjo, gave her opening reading uh, last September uh, in the Thomas Jefferson Building just down the street. Uh, she'll be back for her closing event in late April of next year, but in the meantime, we hope you come check out our literary programs um, in person and online. You can go visit loc.gov slash poetry and find out more. Um, we also have surveys. Uh, I know you got them uh, when you came in. Uh, we'd love to know what you think about tonight's program. So afterwards, if you could please fill them out, you can leave them on your seat. Well, after you yeah. go. <laughs> and Ron always is hard on himself on those surveys. <laughs> Uh, and now on to our featured reader, Reginald Dwayne Betts. Uh, Betts is a graduate of Prince George's Community College, the University of Maryland, the MFA program at Warren Wilson College, and Yale University Law School, where as a fellow at the Arthur Lim Lehman Center for Public Inst Interest Law, he spent a year representing clients in the New Haven Public Defender's Office. His three books of poetry are Shahed Reads His Own Poem, winner of the 2010 Beatrice Hawley Award from Alice James Books, and a National Book Foundation, and they are the people that host the National Book Awards, National Book Foundation Literary for Justice selection in 2018-2019. Bastards of the Reagan Era, winner of the National Council on Crime and Delinquencies 2016 Media for a Just Society Award, as well as a host of other awards, including the 2016 Penn New England Award. And Felon, uh, just published by W.W. Norton and Company, and, and uh, available uh, outside for sale. In addition, Betts has published A Question of Freedom, a memoir of learning, survival, and coming of age in prison, which was awarded the 2010 NAACP Image Award for nonfiction. In 2012, Betts was appointed to the Coordinating Council of the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention by then-President Obama. His many other honors included 2010 Soros Justice Fellowship, a 2011 Radcliffe Fellowship, and a 2012 Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Poetry Fellowship. In 2018, he was awarded both a National Endowment for the Arts and Guggenheim Fellowship and was also named a 2018 Emerson Fellow at New America. He is currently a PhD in law candidate at Yale University. Please join me in welcoming him here to the stage. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm really, really delighted to talk to you tonight. Before we begin, I just wanted to take a moment to recognize what an extraordinary evening this is. Tonight, while we're talking to Mr. Betts about these powerful poems, <laughs> folks are up, well, not that, folks are up in New York at the <laughs> National Book Awards, and Albert Woodfox is up for the National Book Award in Nonfiction for his memoir about being incarcerated for more than 40 years for a crime he did not commit in solitary confinement. Colson Whitehead, his book was long listed for the National Book Award. His novel, uh, The Nickel Boys, about a, notor a real life notorious reformatory school in Florida, which was in fact a prison uh, for boys. 
where horrible, horrible things happened for decades and was reported on for decades and nobody did anything about it. So I think and I hope we're at a moment of attention and understanding and maybe there's some movement toward actually doing something about this in America. Yeah, now, I don't, don't know. Be, don't I don't know. I mean, it's we interesting. We can start with like, some optimism. Well, I mean, that's optimistic. I mean, it's optimistic that on the literary landscape, people are writing about it and writing really well about it. And I mean, I remember just a few years ago when um, I was hard pressed to get some writers to actually consider it as a part of the spectrum of things that they wanted to focus on. So it's really nice to see people like Colson actually doing the work and writing about it now. But one might argue that it's abs absolutely been absent from like the presidential campaign. And one might argue actually that like in terms of like they had a historic, um, the Democrats had a historic victory in Virginia. And people on the ground are fundamentally aware how important this will be for criminal justice reform. It's a possibility to bring parole back in Virginia for the first time and you know since like 1994, 1995. And yet every mainstream conversation about that historic win has ignored that fundamental fact that was possible. So it's sort of like, for me, it's, the, it's a catch-22. I'm encouraged, but I am reminded that on the national landscape, when you would think that this would be the election that would be about criminal justice reform, like the Democratic nominees have consistently decided to make it a side issue. We will change that tonight. Hey, we will. <laughs> <laughs> In this room, we're used to saying that uh, poetry changed our lives. Uh, and sometimes that's a little melodramatic, but in your case, it actually did save your life. You were in solitary confinement and someone slipped an anthology of black poets under the door and you read it and your life was literally changed. Yeah. What were you, how did you end up in prison? Bring um, us all up to speed in your biography. How did I end up in prison? In like a minute and a half. Okay. Um, I carjacked somebody when I was 16. It was December 7th, 1996. Feel free to silence your cell phones <laughs> or answer them because there might be somebody asking you about the debate and you could tell them that the debate is not as important as poetry. <laughs> um, but, uh, and it's wild though because now like 20 some years later I try to talk about what it meant and it's hard to sort of imagine what I, what I was like as a 16 year old and how a 16 year old kid who's never held a gun before becomes a 16 year old kid who is holding a gun and like intentionally committing a carjacking. And I carjacked the man with a friend of mine in uh, Springfield, Virginia on December 7th. We got locked up on December 8th. And um, we both pled guilty. I was sentenced to nine years in prison. And, and it's funny because- uh, In an adult prison. In an adult prison. Why that, didn't you go to juvenile detention or something? Well, because most states in the country still have some mechanism to try juveniles as adults. And in Virginia at that time, if you had, and still, if you had a carjacking, a robbery, or um, a carjacking, a murder, or a rape, you could be tried as an adult automatically. And so I had a carjacking. And what I mean by automatically is, in any other situation, they could attempt to try you as an adult, but a judge would have discretion. A judge could, your, your attorney could put on evidence and make arguments and suggest that you were better treated as a juvenile. But if you had one of those three charges, then it was automatic. And so in my case, it was automatic. And um, it was interesting, I mean, not really interesting, but like for me, um, what has changed is now they have PREA. It's the Prison Rape Elimination Act. And so they have sight and sound separation. So even when young people are tried as adults and are treated as adults, they might get sentenced to 15 years or 20 years, but while they are a juvenile, they have to have sight and sound separation from adults. But for me, once they made the decision to transfer me to the adult jail, I was basically in general population with adults. And, um, and what makes no sense at all, and actually I think about this today, and I'm just reminded of how some type of like reckless belief can lead to your salvation, is that um, when I was sentenced to nine years in prison, I, was, I planned on being an engineer. I was, I was pretty good at math, and I'd taken Pascal for, for those folks who remember before like everybody was programming. Like I'm taking Pascal, I'm taking C++, and I have no idea that I'm breaking in early on an on a industry that will change the world, right? But I'm getting in on the ground level. And then I go to prison, and I'm thinking, enough of that dream. And I decided after I was sentenced to become a writer. And I decided to become a writer not really because I understood what it meant to be a writer, not really because I understood what it meant to publish a book, 
but because I understood that the technology available in prison was much different from what was available in my high school. And I had decided that with an ink pen and some paper, I could become a writer. And so from, from the time I got sentenced, you know, I was like, I'm gonna be a writer. And then um, this is when I'm 16. And so for me at that time, being a writer really just means, you know, writing. I was, I was really self-absorbed and I, I was like not good at description. So I was only writing things that I thought about. And I was writing reviews of, 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 um, of books that I read and things for school. So you fast forward two years and I'm in solitary confinement. And at this particular prison, when you're in a hole, the cells were all parallel. And solitary confinement, the, the hole, the building that was the hole, houses like three classes of prisoners. So you had a group of prisoners that's on protective custody. And that means that they're just afraid of being a general population for whatever reason. And then you have prisoners that's on administrative segregation. And that means that they spent some period on solitary confinement, but you can only keep a prisoner on solitary confinement for like between 15 and 30 days. And then you have to transition them to administrative segregation, which in all actuality is just like the, the conditions of somebody on protective custody, except you're not waiting for you to decide when you feel safe on the yard. You're waiting for the prison to decide when it's okay for you to go back on the yard. And then the third category is solitary confinement. And so I did the first 15, 30 days in solitary confinement, and then I did the next five months in administrative segregation. But the thing is, because it's those three groups that mix, it's really only people in solitary confinement who can't have books. And so you were able to sort of develop an underground library amongst the folks who had administrative segregation and protective custody. And we would just give everybody books. But you wouldn't, like, you couldn't request a book. You could just say, yo, somebody send me a book to read. And people would send you anything. I read so many of those Reader's Digest novels. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. I read, like, an abundance of them. And, uh, and so one day I asked for a book, and somebody sent me The Black Poets by Dudley Randall. And, um, and I read a lot of amazing writers in there, including Lucille Clifton, Sonia Sanchez. But the writer that made me decide to be a poet was Etheridge Knight because he had been locked up, and he had written about being incarcerated. And I felt like I was locked up, he had been locked up. If he was able to do it, then I could do it. And also, like the very first poem of his I read was like for Freckle Face Gerald, and it was about a 16-year-old kid getting raped in prison. And I was like really self-centered at the time, and it depends on who you talk to, they might say I'm still self-centered. But um, that was a joke, nobody laughed. They was like, <laughs> they was like that was a stunning amount of self-awareness, but I wish you would change your life. <laughs> But, uh, but no, like, um, so I read this poem and it was about, and, and I thought everything was about me and this sort of generation of dudes that I knew. My, my sort of cadre of young guys who all got locked up as 14, 15 year olds. But Knight had been in prison in the 70s and he wrote a poem about a 16 year old who had been in prison in the 70s and it just made me really change my perspective. And it did two things. It made me understand that poetry could do more than just convey emotions or convey how a writer was feeling. It could actually convey a political landscape. Hmm. But also it made me aware that poetry can make you aware of something about yourself that you didn't realize beforehand. And so it's one line that says, um, 16 years old hadn't even, 16 years hadn't even done a good job on my voice. And it says something like, um, I couldn't even talk tough. Or it says he couldn't even talk tough. And he couldn't like win the favor of the young cats around him. And it made me aware that I had all kinds of talents and skills that I, I should be thankful for because, you know, I was cool and, and people liked me and I didn't have the kind of struggles that the character in this, in this poem had. And so when I decided to be a poet, it was because I recognized that if a poem can help me teach myself something about who I was in the world, maybe I could write 10 lines, 15 lines, 20 lines that you could consume in a minute's time and it would, it would stay with you. And that's very different from like no 16 year old kid. I mean, now some 16 year old kids, but like really, 16 year old kid imagine writing a novel, they, they gotta be insane. And yeah. it was much easier for me to say, I could write a poem, and so I became a poet. I've never asked someone in this series about the cover of one of their books, but this cover is so striking, and then becomes thematic, and you mention it in the book, that yeah. I feel like I can ask you. Yeah, yeah. Tell us about this image. So um, a good friend of mine named Titus Gaffar is a visual artist. And um, he lives in New Haven. I live in New Haven. And um, we did a project together called The Redaction. And it's a series of prints. 
And so some of the poems in the book actually are the basis of some of the prints. But the actual prints have etchings done by Titus on them as well. And the poems are six silk screen on paper in two different colors. But I was looking for, um, I have a problem with publishers. And with my last book, I was like, you know, I was so mad at the world and at the publishing industry and at the poetry world. I was like, I don't want a cover. I don't want any artwork. I don't want my name on the book. You know, we just gonna release it. And they were like, well, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> and they were like, you know, we gonna have a title. And I was like, all right, well, we got a title. And they were like, and we also gonna have your name. But we will let you go with no artwork. And so Bastards of Reagan era had no artwork. And part of the reason was because I thought that there was no art that, that, that could capture the, the moment that I wanted to, to bring out in the book. And, um, but with this one, I knew that I wanted to use some of Titus's work. And we had been working together so closely already while doing a book that it just became a part of the general process. And the reason why I wanted to use that art is because he had looked up the name of, um, of this cat and the guy name was on James. And, uh, and he found a bunch of people with the same name who had been incarcerated. And so he created a name Jerome. And so he created a series called the Jerome Project. And it was 99 different portraits. But in this portraits on this, this kind of metal that's about this large, right? And each portrait was dipped in tar. And the way that it was dipped in tar was to reflect the amount of time that the people had served in prison. And so I had a couple of challenges with the portrait. I had, with the cover, I had to pick portraits that were completely immersed in tar. And then I had to understand why I did that. And part of the reason that I chose to do that is because what happens when you are convicted of a felony frequently is that that obscures everything else people think about you. Yes. And so when you look at the cover that way, uh, you recognize that um, if you really want to know who those people are on the cover, you have to read the book. And then I hope the book suggests that even still, it is much more about all of those lives that can't be un uh, you know, captured in, in 100 pages of poetry. Did you read this opening poem for us? Uh, yeah, so the opening poem is called A Guzzle. And, and none of these things need explanation, but I, I just want to explain it because um, it's kind of cool as an audience to know what's happening because it allows you to listen differently. Right. So the guzzle has, it's a poem in couplets, and you should think of it like a, a string of pearls. And so each pearl is its own beautiful thing that's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily need the other pearl to be beautiful. And uh, in each couplet, so the first couplet ends with the repeating refrain, after prison. So the first two lines, each line ends with after prison. And then each subsequent couplet, the final line in the couplet ends with after prison. And the word before after prison is rhymed. So in this case, it's expect, suspect, dialect, reflect. And then the final piece to note is that the writer of the poem always signs his name in the last couplet. In prison, everybody called me Shahid because, um, you know, cats was like naming themselves to become somebody. And I wanted to become somebody too. And the word, the, the name Shahid, I mean, is like Persian for witness. And I thought, what am I here for except to be a witness? And so I named myself Shahid. I was trying to be like Prince too, so I ain't had no last name, you know? <laughs> um, this is an Arabic form? It's an Arabic form. Guzzle. But it's actually really popular in India. And so they have like, it's, it's a, 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 like a musical genre in India. Guzzle. Name a song that tells a man what to expect after prison. Explains Occam's razor. You're still a suspect after prison. Titus Kafar painted my portrait, then dipped it in black tar. He knows redaction is a dialect after prison. From inside a cell, the night sky isn't the measure. That's why it's prison's vastness, your eyes reflect after prison. My lover don't believe in my sadness. She says whiskey, not time, is what left me wrecked after prison. Ruth, paper maker, take these tattered gray sweats, make paper of my bed, a pass I won't reject after prison. The state murdered Khalif with a single high bell. Always innocent. Did he fear his time's effect after prison? Dear warden, 
My time been served. Let me go. Promise that some of this I won't recollect after prison. My mother has died. My father, a brother, and two cousins. There is no God. No reason to genuflect after prison. Jeremy and Forrest rejected the template. Said for it to be funky, the font must redact after prison. He came home saying righteous coochie and jive turkey. All them lost years, his slang's architect after prison. The printer silk screens the world on the black paper. With ink, Eric reveals what we neglect after prison. My homeboy says he's done with all that prison shit. His wife and baby girl gave him love to protect after prison. Them fools, they say you can become anything when it's over. Told him straight up, ain't nothing to resurrect after prison. You have come so far, beloved. And for what? Another song? Then sing, Shaheed, your love, not shipwreck after prison. Thank you. Thank you. I want to talk about this tension between forgetting and acknowledging, which runs throughout all your poems. This concept of redaction being a special dialogue of speaking about prison life is so, so troubling and poignant. Uh, You've got a poem called Essay on Reentry. We have several poems, yeah, which is a, a maddening thing for a scholar, you know. <laughs> if you keep naming your poems the same title. Uh, but uh, I wonder if you'd read that poem. Uh, which, so I'm reading uh, Essay, Essay on, on Reentry. Entry. For Nicholas Davidoff. Of prison, no one tells you the time will steal your memories until there's nothing left but script searches in the hole and fights and hidden shanks and spades games. You come home and become a parade of confessions that leave you drowning. Laws recounting the disappeared years. You say, fuck this world with background checks like fingerprints announce the crime. Where so much of who you are betrays guilt older than you. Your pops, uncles, a brother, two cousins, and enough childhood friends for a game of throwback all learned absurdity from shackles. But we wear the mask that grins and lies. Why pretend these words don't seize our breath? Prisoner, inmate, felon, convict, nothing can be denied. Not the gun that delivered you to that place where you witness the images that won't let you go. Catfish learning to subtract his eyes a heron slurred mess. Blue black doing backflips and state boots. The DC kid that killed his cellmate, Jesus. Barely older than you, he had one of the shirts made by other men in prison. Boxes, socks that slouched, shackles gripping his shins. Damn near naked, life waiting. Outside your cell, you could see them wheel the dead man down the way. The pistol you pressed against a stranger's temple gave you that early morning. And now, boxes checked have become your North Star, Philip, catalyst to despair, death by prison stretch. Tell me, what name for this thing that haunts, this thing we become? Thank you. Thank you. Several of these poems are about the work of overcoming, or at least confronting, this desire to redact, to block out, to bury, to hide, to forget. But at the same time, you're memorializing these experiences. You're forcing yourself to confess over and over again throughout these poems. You come home and become a parade of confessions that leave you drowning, lost, recounting the disappeared years. Nothing can be denied. I mean, you just hear the, the pain in those, in those lines. Last year, you published an essay in the New York Times Magazine called, Could a con an Ex-Convict Become an Attorney? I Intended to Find Out. And the most painful sentence in that really painful essay was, 
I couldn't explain how a confluence of bad decisions and opportunity led me to become the caricature of a black boy in America. Yeah, no, I think, um, You say in another poem, why must I pay for being this stereotype? It's a confession, it's a complaint, it's a denial, it's an admission. Yeah, I think, um, I think it's interesting, right? Because if you, if you think seriously about incarceration and crime and violence in America, you, you confront it with this paradox. Um, the easy sort of explanation is to discuss it in the context of like slavery. But then you think, well, Dwayne, you keep comparing prison to slavery, but you put a pistol to somebody's head. And I just have a hard time understanding how like, you shape out to be Kunta Kente. Um, and so I think the struggle of the book is grappling with that paradox and trying to acknowledge that paradox. And I think the struggle with the New York Times essay is trying to acknowledge that paradox. And, um, and there really are no, no easy answers. Yeah. And in some ways, I think the admission becomes the best that we could deal with. And you have a, you know, and it's, it's, it's strange because um, somebody wrote a really frustrating review of the book for me. And, um, and it, was a, it was a great review. It was about this guy named John J. Lennon. A friend of mine said, John Lennon? Wrote a review of your book? Show your shit is so good that you raising people from the dead? And they was like, you know, I know you say there's nothing to resurrect after prison, but you brought the Beatles back. And, um, and it was really funny to me because I just discovered this band. I don't know if y'all heard of them called Queen. It was really, really, really amazing. And, um, but Lennon's in prison now, <laughs> right? Review. Yeah, oh yeah, Lennon. So John J. Lennon is actually this white cat that's in prison now. He's been locked up for 28 years, and he wrote a review of Felon, and he wrote it for the Poetry Foundation. But what was most troubling about his review for me was he said that my book frustrated him and that it made him think that there was no escape in incarceration. Right. And he, I do think that He that's, found your book depressing, in other words. <laughs> right. He's in prison, <laughs> and, and <laughs> your book made him depressed. That shit made me so sad, <laughs> you know? And, um, but what I might have told him that every book suggests a book yet to be written. And I mean, I've been married for 11 years, and I have two beautiful kids. And, you know, and I have, like, friends. I have really great friends. I mean, me and Ashley went to Maine. You know, we went on a road trip to Maine for me to read poetry in front of folks. And, like, my uncle's here, my, nephew, my, um, my cousin's here. So, like, you know, every book suggests a book that's yet to be written. And that's what I would say to him if I talked to him. But if he says, why is this book circling a wagon, it's because the wagon is there. And, and I think that sometimes, you know, in my own life, I've recognized that the best way for me to deal with it is acknowledging that the wagon is there. Right. And, and, and yes, the poems constantly acknowledge that. But I love spades. And so when I say that, you know, um, it's these things that haunt, like the spades games is also part of the things that haunt, you know. It's all, and, and the haunt is not necessarily a bad thing. And so the spades games has slipped into there subtly, right? But it's in there. And I also think part of, part of the power of the book, if there's anything that's powerful in it, is, is for me, is that I could tell the story, you know? And I try to self-correct, but the truth is certain things that you do to other people, maybe you shouldn't be able to like run away from. And that's part of what I try to acknowledge too. Would you read uh, Parking Lot 2? Oh, shit. <laughs> 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 All okay. the way to the end, listen to this poem. Oh, man. Is this being recorded? It is. It's live, and it will be up online afterwards on Facebook. <laughs> that was so rhetorical. <laughs> 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 Sorry. I'm going to say one thing, too. The best part of that essay by John Lennon is that he mentioned this poem, and then in a parenthetical, he talked about editing the, 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 his piece online and how uncomfortable it was or how uncomfortable it was for him to relay the edits for this particular poem and again he's a white guy so i say that because that was just so such an important admission right that the poem made him uncomfortable for the language itself the poem didn't give him permission to say things the poem made him uncomfortable 
being aware of the history that's behind some of the things that said in the piece. Parking lot two. A confession began when I walked out of that parking lot. A confession began when I walked black out of that parking lot. A confession began when I, without combing my hair, dressed for a day that would find me walking out of that parking lot. There is so much to be said of a black man with unkempt hair. He meets the description of the suspect. Suspect is running. I ran away from things far less frightening than the police. A confession began when I rolled myself in black. A confession began when I walked out of that parking lot wearing a black hoodie. Things get exponentially worse when a hoodie is pulled over my unkempt hair. A confession began when I walked out of that parking lot black. A confession began when I walked out of that parking lot a Negro. A confession begins when that nigga walked into the parking lot. A confession begins when that nigga and the pistol he carries like a dick walked into that parking lot. A confession begins when everything you see him doing is seen as sex. A confession begins when that nigga and the pistol he carries like a dick walked into that parking lot. A confession begins when everything you see him doing is seen as sex. A confession begins when that nigga walked into a parking lot and drove away with everything belonging to that white man. A confession begins when my mother laid up with a man, the complexion of that nigga's daddy. A confession begins when my mother births a child in a city close enough to make me and that nigga almost related. A confession begins when the police perceive us as one. We must be one. He could not have walked in and driven out, and I walked in and walked out on the same night. And whatever gaps in the story and slight differences in the features of our faces was just more evidence that niggers will lie. A confession begins even if I didn't have the fucking car. A confession begins. My confession began with a woman stitching stars and stripes into a flag. That is a really tough poem. Yeah. That is so the first time I've read that in public. And I think it's a good poem, I should say. But it's like every time when I'm flipping through the book, I be telling people, I'm like, yo, this book is so good, I can read anything in it. And I'll land on that poem and be like. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very uncomfortable poem in the way that it interrogates American racism throughout and confesses to the personal crime committed, actually committed, not just accused. Right. But puts it in the context. It doesn't avoid responsibility, but it expands responsibility all the way to that last incredibly powerful line about Betsy Ross there, sewing those flags in, uh, sewing the stars in. Uh, why does it make you so uncomfortable to perform? Because I'm not trying to give white people the permission to be saying the word nigger, just like willy-nilly. Like, yo, he said it. I could say it. And I should just say that that was not my intention at all. And some of y'all are like, damn, fuck. I don't know how to respond to him saying that. <laughs> but like, it is so funny to me. It is probably shouldn't be funny. But I had people say to me, like, you know, because I say the word nigger all the time. And I try to say it only in certain company, but sometimes you slip. And sometimes I just be like, fuck it. And I call white folks nigger too just to just, just fuck up the dynamics of it. Because cause if you say, wait, I'm not a nigga, then it's like, wait, am I? You know? <laughs> so it, I just say it, right? But then I fucked around and had somebody say it to me. And, and, and I was like, and they weren't saying it to me as me. They were saying it to me about my work. And it felt like they cut my head off with a, like, a rusty machete. And so like, I have un I'm uncomfortable. But even if you read the poem in the book, you notice that at the end, the word, it goes from Negro to nigga to nigger, and I'm trying to rhetorically emphasize some moment in history right. with all of those that's, changes. Yes. But the thing that's uncomfortable about it is like, we all approach history in a very, very different way. And like none of us necessarily want to be wrong in certain ways. And also we all want to have permission to say every word that exists in a dictionary or in the world. But we just, we just don't, right? And so what makes me uncomfortable like reading it is that part of me recognizes that like, maybe I should resist to need to like troll you 
You know, maybe I should resist the need to say some shit that while I say it, I am reminding you that you can't say it. Maybe that is not being a good citizen. Or maybe that's being the best citizen. Like, I literally don't know what it means to, to be in that moment. And I do feel like what I really liked about his piece is that he captured all of that in a parenthetical. He just said, tr he just said, given edits to this part of the essay made me really uncomfortable. Close parentheses. And he didn't dwell on it. He said, I'm in prison. I'm, I'm, I'm giving edits over a phone. I want to talk about this poem. If you didn't want me to talk about it, you shouldn't have said it. Maybe in another world, I could type my edits and I could email it and I wouldn't have to say it. But I am actually in the one place on the fucking planet where for me to acknowledge this thing that you've done, I have to say this shit out loud. And it bothers me, right? And to me, that was such a powerful piece in the essay because it is acknowledging my own like lack of comfort in reading the actual poem. Because maybe I just don't feel good putting people in that situation, you know? And I also don't feel good, like the poem is imagining the fact that like I could have committed this crime and then somebody who looked remotely like me got picked up the next day. Right. You know, we talk about people getting picked up for crimes they didn't commit, but we rarely talk about the fact that somebody committed that crime that looked in some approximate way to them. And it might be completely dissimilar. It might be that the person that committed the crime was light skinned and five foot two and not dark skinned and six foot eight. But the point is, somebody had a gun put in their face. And the, and the history of American racism means that, like, if, if the question is, am I my brother's keeper, then the question becomes, am I responsible for the way my brother suffers for the crimes that I commit? And that's also part of the sort of subtext of the poem. Right. We may have to black most of that out when we. <laughs> oh, we got to You got to block that out. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> just, kidding. <laughs> just kidding, Rob. Uh, Rob, uh, this will be up on the Library of Congress website forever. The uncensored version. <laughs> yeah, the uncensored version. The director's cut, as they say. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Uh, the poem. Another poem called "Confession." in your first book. No, I took the wrong. Sorry, not there yet. Uh, read that poem for us. Confession. Whoa, was that me? Yeah. Confession. If I told her how often I thought of prison, she would walk out of the door that's led just as much to madness as any home we desired. She would walk out and never return. My employers would call me a liar and fire me. My dreams are not all nightmares, but this history has turned my mind's landscape into a gadroon. I do not sing. Have lied for so many months now that truth harbingers lost. Sleeping beside her when the memory is holding me tight as she did before the lies turn everything into a battle. I once gasped and lurched and tried to strangle the pillow she placed beneath my head. Imagining me explaining that to her while still shivering like a panicked and broken man. I stopped believing in God long before then. But that night, when outside there was no light but darkness, I swore something of what inevitable is touched me. My children slept with their light on. I walked to that still lit room. My son was asleep and his brother draped over his body as if he were the pillow. The way he loved his brother was everything my time in the cell denied me. If I told my woman that, she would want to know if I thought I deserved all that lost. Her mother wonders why I won't let it go and hold on to the happiness in the life we have. But how do I explain it outside on nights like this? It's where I first learned just how violent I might be that I think of prison, because in all these years, I still can't pronounce the name of my victim. 
That's a different kind of confession, isn't it? How do you confess what's haunting you to the people you love without frightening them? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, I guess you write a poem, but that's not about me, so I don't know. I mean, maybe you write a poem. I mean, maybe, you, I mean, what if the people, I'm, my people don't read poems. You read that poem? My uncle ain't read that poem yet. Like, and, and, um, and that's not even, I, I think what happens, though, is I think it's always, maybe I think the point of the poem is to begin thinking something beyond the poem. And so it is a real dilemma. And I think it's, it's not just like a prison dilemma. You know, I think that everybody who's human struggles with confessing something that they know is true, but they know if they admit to somebody else, if they admit it to somebody that they love, it'll hurt them. And in fact, writing a poem and announcing that thing is, is a way to make the idea like tangible and real. And I think um, it's acknowledging that um, it's supposed to be a landscape of suffering. You only have joy if you recognize the way you've suffered, maybe, you know. There's some beauty in that. You can only recognize how you suffered if you recognize how somebody else isn't. The whole idea of seeing your children in the kind of joy that you didn't even know you needed or wanted until that very moment is a beautiful thing. You know, my man reads the poem and he says, this is sad. And I say, well, maybe. But if you got kids, it's the kind of joy that some people don't get. Like, you know, you just walk past in that way. And, and somebody put a pillow under somebody's head in that poem. I did eight and a half years in prison. Ain't no motherfucker ever put a pillow under my head. I'm kind of thankful for it, you know. Like, but nobody ever said, Dwayne, you need an extra pillow. You know what I mean? Like nobody said, I was in solitary confinement once for like nine days without a mattress, a blanket, or a pillowcase. I had a little small sheet to cover my body with. Nine full days in a hole, COs walking past three, three times a day or like, you know, three times an hour. And nobody looked at my cell and said, damn, it's strange. It's February, it's cold, and you don't have a blanket or a mattress or a pillow. So I also think, you know, like writing a poem that confesses that having somebody treat you with tenderness is also a joy. It might not be the joy that people expect, but I, I think it's a joy that's worth noting. And, and so I think the confession exists within like, do you have a right to complain when you admit that such joy exists? Now I should say, that if you, like that poem is not me, and this is the favorite poem I point to when people are like, all of your poems are about you. I'm like, bruh, ask Therese. She will tell you that I haven't had a job since we lived in DC. Like there is no employer in the country that will say that they didn't know that I've been incarcerated. So like the point of all of these pieces is not just to tell you something about who I am. Because I think if, if, if we ever read it that way, if any reader ever reads it that way, then they miss the experience that I get all over the country. You know, when I was in North Country, during that reading, this guy came up to me and said, he said, um, brother, I knew you was the one giving the reading when I saw you. And I was completely offended because I was the only black person in the room, right? And then he whispered to me, you know, I did 28 years. And he told me what he did the 28 years for. And I was like, shit. And, it, and, it, and so like, he gets it in a way. And the poems are his experience. And if people reduce it to my experience, then it's much easier to justify not having a really robust conversation about how it's so many people in our country that are suffering in these ways. You tempt us to think the I in these poems is you again and again. Yeah, no, I mean, I shouldn't say that for the camera, but it's a, it's a way that like, it's a way that like, you know, I figure out how to, I mean, part of it is like, some of it is me, right? So right. you cheat, like this, cool hoodie, um, it's kind of bulky, so I can't take it off to show you my tattoo. But I got a poem that I refer to my tattoo. But like, you know, so 40% of the poem is me, right. maybe 60% isn't. Right. And the temptation though, is just, it's only because I'm alive. Like yes. when I'm dead, people won't have that same temptation. And so I can't write being beholden to that temptation. And also though, I mean, some of it is ugly. And, 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 and I think about how people that I'm close to get judged for that ugly. And if I'm only willing to make that ugly representative of people outside of myself, then I think I'm doing all of the work a disservice because I'm not even fully able to tap into the empathy that I need to embody 
the kind of worlds that I'm trying to embody in the work. You, in one poem, you say, uh, you say, it doesn't, when I say I, that doesn't mean me, per se. I say that? You do. <laughs> 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 That's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> you once uh, you once joked in a that a poetry collection is like a dating ad. You yeah. Want, you want to use the lyric "I" in a way that makes people admire you, that makes people want to be close to you. Yeah, for real. It's so funny though. My life has worked out. I, like I read this poem to my wife the first day we met, and it was an elegy. You know what I mean? And so this is my my theory of life. Like I've been married for eleven years. She still thinks I'm cool, and um. But the first poem I met wasn't a poem that made me look any kind of way. It was a poem that, that admitted that like a friend of mine got murdered a decade ago and it fucked with me still. And, and I think that um, I, try, I try to live by that notion that like I don't want to write work that, that makes me look a way that, that people will hear me and say I'm exceptionally sensitive or whatever because I don't, I don't want to write a date in that, you know, so. <laughs> if you'd, uh Read a poem which does seem to be about you. Oh, Shahid reads his own poem? Well, that announces itself about me. Um, yeah, this is a, uh, well, some of it is, some of it's not. Shahid reads his own poem. I should say, though, the backdrop of this is the title of the book. And it's such a cool story that I can't resist telling it. Please. Um, so it's like, why you call it Shahid reads his own poem? Well, one time I was in New York. I tried to go to a palm reader. <laughs> and we went to the first spot. And it, the, the internet said they were open. You know? Google said it's open. We got there, they were closed. But I'm, I'm fairly intellectual. So I learned my lesson. So when I Googled the next spot, I called them first. She said, if you get here within 20 minutes, I could see you. It was raining. We ran, got there in 11 minutes. I'm going up the steps, she's going down. Sorry, emergency just happened. What? <laughs> Couple months later, I'm driving on 301. I'm at the 301 on the far Maryland end, and I'm coming up, and I ain't got to the Baskin Robbins yet, right? And I pass the Baskin Robbins, and I see a big sign that says, Palm Reading Here. I bust a U turn. <laughs> this was one of those houses, there's not many houses on 301, like right on the road. Yeah. I pull up on the, on the grass because everybody else is. I go inside, talk to the lady. She give me the price. Then she looks at me dead in the eye. This ain't for you, young man. <laughs> what? I was so taken aback that I just left. And if you know me, I complain about everything. <laughs> I just left. And I was trying to find a title for my book. And I was like, well, sometimes Shahid got to read his own poem. <laughs> So, um, Shahid reads his own poem. I come from the cracked hands of men who use the smoldering and the blunts to blow shotguns. Men who arrange their lives around the mystery of the moon breaking a street corner in half. I come from Swan Row written in a child's slanted block letters across a playground fence. The orange glow with black stripes in Bishop's left hand untethered and rolling to the sideline, a crowd open mouth, waiting to see the end of the sweetest crossover in a Virginia state pen. I come from Friday night's humid and musty air, junkyard band cranking in a stolen Bonneville. A tilted bottle, a tilted bottle of wild average rose against my lips and King Headley's secret written in the lines of my palm. I come from beneath a cloud of white smoke, a lit pipe, in the way glass heats rocks into a piece of heaven. From the weight of nothing in my palm, a bullet in an unfired snub nosed revolver. And every day, the small muscles in my finger threaten to pull a trigger, slight and curved like my woman's eyelashes. Thank you. <clears throat> We're always tempted with lyric poetry to imagine the I as the author. That's a very common readerly yeah. mistake or temptation. Uh, the critical commentary about your work often, always, leads with your biography. It 
dominates discussion of your work. Nobody begins discussions of Carl Phillips or, uh, or other poems with other poets with their biography. Do you think that's, it reminded me of a way, in your poems about how when you were applying for a job, the incarceration was always, got, it always got in the way. It always was interrupting your efforts to move on with your life. Is it irritating to have your biography always front and center in the critical response to your poems? Sometimes I always wanted to say, you know, the poem on the page is really good. Can we just talk about the poem on the page? Yeah, well, you know, that's a really interesting question because, um, because even if we don't court it in terms of the way that people write about our books, which we have no control over, right. we always court it in terms of the way we present the work that we write. Like I've never seen a poet not present the work that they write in the context of the life that they live, even when the work that they write is only tangentially related to the life that they live. So you can't not know that Carl Phillips is a gay black man. You, you can't. And I would argue that the work announces itself as such. And maybe you could imagine that it's this straight black dude that's writing this really cool, like, gay black man shit. It's like, damn, how does he understand this world so much? But it's kind of unlikely, you know? And, and so I, I wonder, like, to the degree that that's true, for me, it's true because prison is, is like getting hit in the face. You know, you become an anomaly because you almost become a rarity. You know, and, and like, it's not that many of us who come out of prison and they write. But also, if you decide as a writer, uh, Mitchell Jackson just wrote a piece for, your, for, for the Post, right? And I was kicking with him about it, and it's a, it's, a, it's a short story. But I bet five to one that most people read it think it's about Mitch. Because it's a short story about a guy that's coming home from prison. But you could take Edward P. Jones, who is also from D.C., who wrote a short story about some guys coming home from prison that happens to not be in the first person, and nobody would assume that Ed P. Jones is writing about somebody who came out of prison. But the thing is, as a writer, your obsessions dominate you. And so if the question is, should I be obsessed with something else, because then that would give room to think solely about what's on the page, it's like, I can't be obsessed with something else, though. That's just what it is. And do I often wish that it was another way? I guess maybe, it, maybe I do, but it goes back to the earlier answer. You circle the wagon that you circle. Right. And, and I would love maybe to circle some other wagon, but when I come to the page, I, I find that I'm drawn to write about the things that I write about. And, um, and it only matters until I die, you know? Like while I'm living, if, if, the, if the discussion of my work forces you to actually answer complicated questions about the role that the eye plays in poetry, then so be it. But if I got a poem about domestic violence, if you go to any domestic violence courtroom in the country, that is the most democratic place in America. I once saw a postal worker in domestic violence court with his postal clothes on. And he was 54. And I thought to myself, why are you beating up somebody you love? The same day a 15-year-old kid was in there. A 33-year-old woman was in there. A mother of four kids was in there trying to get the man who knocked her, slammed the fuck out, released from prison. So if I write a poem that's about domestic violence, if you need to obsess over whether or not I put my hands on my wife, you're missing a complete point. Mm -hmm. and, and if I have to be afraid of writing that poem because I think that you're going to judge my marriage, then I'm missing the point. And so I think at the end of the day, that's where I land on. But I could only land on that because, like, I'm really a halfway decent person. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like, I'm good. Like, I'm just not even really concerned that, like, people who really know me will be like, you know, I thought they had a good marriage. But, man, is he, like, like he seems like a bad dude. You know, like, and, and, and I didn't even know his mom is dead. I, I, that's just not even funny. Like, you know, like, it's so much shit that's in the book that's like fundamentally untrue, that like people who really know me would be like, yeah, that's, that just can't be true. You know, like, like it's just ways in which I'm clearly talking about a world that is really close to me in ways you can't know. But it's close to me, but, but you can't know it. But, but I don't think you have to know it to dig the poetry. I think the poetry to have meaning, it should have meaning. Like the difference between gossip and gospel is if it's just gossip, then it only matters to people who really know these things about me.
But if it's gospel, then it's able to expand beyond the page. It's able to expand beyond the like trivial circumstances of my life, you know. We're gonna stand up and then sit back down. You must stand up. <laughs> now we'll sit back down. I'm gonna go a little bit longer. If you must leave, feel free. We're gonna stick with this. I'm down. I may only get to come to the Library of Congress once, and I will be telling, my son is a huge reader, and so this like boosted my credibility <laughs> as a cool dad by like a thousand points with him. He's gonna go to school, be like, my, my, my dad was at the Library of Congress. <laughs> this class was gonna be like, what? He was testifying before Congress. Is he getting impeached? <laughs> Actually, that's what I wanna talk about. <laughs> The most moving and sometimes devastating poems in these collections have to do with, your, with fathers and fatherhood. Uh, in a poem called Exile, you write, No letters distinguish my father's name from my own. I arrived like that man's shadow. If you read a poem called A Father Talks to Himself. A father talks to himself. A fist tonight slams upside my head, brushes wind, which brushes yesterday's potash off my shirt. I dug dirt for hours and planted St. Augustine grass on land still begging water's touch. I say, fuck this starved ground, this rain, the crimes that lend my face to Junior's wild, wild life. I know some things. It's April now, with the sun cutting shadows and the dead men on grass and gravel. When my arm transforms this shovel into a shank that jabs at earth, my fist holding the spade's thin neck, I know the size of the cell Junior calls home and how it talks to him at night, each night. It was built with bricks the same as Lawton's hell, that hard mud that draws out hurt from bones and pores was left into a fist. I called my sister asking where my son had gone. A man is crushed when he doesn't know steps that will lead back to the years and life he left behind for a fight with the street at night's hunger. His mom don't call my name for nothing since she left his sound in my mad machete rage. She left my voice in a cage and I don't blame that woman for love. I never was enough saint to leave sin with the devil, leave my lies unsaid. I live flush with the anger that ran my son to jail. Never did teach him much about the land or how this rain is good for any grass. Now I swallow regrets. Let the rain learn me something about this hurt. Thank you. Can you tell us about your father and his influence on you? I don't know. I didn't invite him to the read tonight. <laughs> Maybe I could tell him that. That's not. That's probably not cool either. I didn't invite my grandfather either. I actually didn't invite my uncle. <laughs> that's fucked. <fine. laughs> I mean, just you know, being honest. Um, so what does all of that mean? It's all of that means is that you write poems about people who sometimes you don't want to hear talk about the poems that you write. And ah, uh, uh, man, my dad is cool, and I don't even know if um. I mean, he read that book, but I'm not sure exactly if he would say that that captures anything that's true about what he might say if he talked about the world. But I find myself, um, you know, one of the dilemmas, I think, of, of being black and in the 80s and growing up in a community where, like, fathers were kind of absent, right? Uh, like, we talk about mass incarceration in these really loose terms, but one of the things I think it means is that a generation of men were disappearing frequently two years at a time. And it's really hard to establish some normalcy, either as a single unit family or as like a you know, non-traditional kind of family when you're just cycling out of crime and addiction and incarceration. Um, 
But what I would say is that my dad is the only person I've heard use the word discursive that wasn't a poet or academic. And, and I would say that, you know, some of the best advice I've gotten, uh, my dad gave me. And I would say that, you know, so much of what this life is, I publish under Reginald Dwayne Betts now, um, instead of Shahid or Dwayne Betts or any other thing I might publish under, is because I recognize that, you know, my dad might have been a lot of things given different circumstances. And, um, and so I publish under, under, under our shared name as opposed to under what would uniquely be mine because I like the idea that he's like selling my book on the street to motherfuckers acting like he wrote it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> nah, he give me credit. <laughs> you have a poem here called Blood History. If you read that. Blood History. I should say about this poem and give a shout out to Therese. She taught me the word perseverate, and I like to think that I know words, but she taught me the word perseverate. Uh, and then she'd be like, yo, why do you keep perseverating on the word perseverate? <laughs> <laughs> Blood history. The things that abandon you get remembered different. As precise as the English language can be, with words like penultimate and perseverate, there is not a combination of sounds that describe only that leaving. Once, Drinking and smoking with buddies, a friend asked if I'd long for a father. Had he said wanted, I would have dismissed him in a way that youngest dismiss it all. A shrug, sarcasm, a jab to his stomach, laughter. But he said longing. And at a different place, I might have wept. Said once my father lived with us and then he didn't. And it fucked me up so much. I never thought about his leaving until I held my own son in my arms and only now speak on it. A man who drank Boone's Farm and Mad Dog like water once told me and some friends that there is no word for father where he comes from, not like we know it. There, the word father is the same as the word for listen. The blunts we passed around let us forget our tongues. Not that much, though. But what if the old head knew something? And if you have no father, you can't hear straight. Years later, another friend wondered why I named my son after my father. You know, that's a thing turn your life to a prayer that no dead man gonna answer. And now you're a father yourself. Of two. A better father. Uh, you know, my son raised my little brother. I mean, my, <laughs> my, my father raised my little brother pretty well. Yes. But I, I'm good. I'm a good father. I don't, I don't know if I, you know. We all have our feelings, but I'm a good dad. I'm pretty good. You open your second book with a poem about your sons. Yeah. The book's very dark, but that poem's not. But that's the prologue. And the prologue is suggesting that this is a thing that's at the beginning right. that you might not see through everything else that goes through. And so the idea is that like, if you carry the prologue with you, it's just this possibility of another layer to every one of the stories you hear. And, uh, you know, and like, you know, I mean, like, somebody said that you could only, I mean, I, I struggle with what it means to write dark work, but it's like, Just because you acknowledge the darkness in the world doesn't mean that you become brutal. It doesn't mean that you become dark or spiteful or vengeful. You know, it's like, I mean, I wrote about people that I love in that book and yes. people who often aren't in my family. And I wrote about situations and things that I wish I could do more about. And yes. so I'm struck by this notion that if you write something that's dark, it means that you imagine that the world must be dark. And it is what troubled me about John's review. Right. Because, like, the thing is, you know, you got a story to tell. And the story to tell isn't always the most happiest story. No. But that doesn't mean it doesn't need to be told. And, and, and like, unless I plan on not writing any more work, I, you know, ask me when I'm 90. It's like, it's like look, look, um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg has hired one black law clerk in, like, 50 years. I still got hope for her. <laughs> you know? <laughs> So if I still got hope for her, 
to hire some black law clerk. <laughs> People can have hope for me. It's like I'm only 39, you know. I'm going to get to the joyous poems soon as my kid gets through puberty, you know. <laughs> <laughs> there is a suggestion in that poem that the family is an oasis, a protection, a uh, place of joy in a world that can be very dangerous. Yeah, and in a world that could be like um, unforgiving. You know, you apply for a job, you say you have a felony conviction. I mean, I applied, I applied to, you know, Harvard Law School, had a full tuition and academic scholarship. And they found out I had a criminal record and I didn't get that scholarship. Well, I didn't call my mom and cry. In fact, I ain't tell nobody but my wife. My son was a baby. And it was like, all right, cool, what's plan B? Because, like, it wasn't a possibility for me to say, so you, now you're not going to get a college degree because Howard said no. Right. So, like, the home is both an oasis and a reminder that sometimes acknowledging the suffering doesn't mean that you quit right there. You know, I could come home and tell Therese I ain't like what was going on today. I ain't like I was treated. And it's like, bet, now what happens? And I think that's the kind of conversation that, that happens, you know, when you love somebody. And it also happens when you struggle with things and, and you trying to figure out what it means to be a, a, a loving person in the world with the only person that's like, we need not give up on this. Especially when you have you know, kids. Yeah, I mean, they like they want shit, you know, like attention yeah. and love and Similac, you know what I mean? <laughs> you have a, a poem I, called Winter Hunger in which you write, and now when your son wakes, what will you say about fathers? What will you say about a voice cuffed to mistakes? I want you to read a poem for us called When I Think of Tamir Rice While Driving. You might... Mind? Yeah, yeah, I read it. I've revised this poem like a hundred times and I always have trouble. When I think of Tamir Rice while driving, in the back seat, my sons laugh and tussle, far from Tamir's age, adorned with his complexion and cadence, and already warned about toy pistols. Though my rhetoric ain't about fear, but dislike about how guns have haunted me since I first gripped the pistol. I think of Tamir twice blink and confront my weepings inadequacy, how some laws invents the geometry that baffles. The Second Amendment, cold, cruel, a constitutional violence, a ruthless thing worrying me still. Should be, it predicts the heft in my hand, arm sag, burdened by what I bear. My bare arms collage with wings as if hope alone can bring back a buried child. A child, a toy gun, a blue shield's rapid, rapid, rabbit shit. This is how misery sounds. My boy's playing in the back seat, juxtaposed against a 12-year-old's murder playing in my head. My tongue cleaves to the roof of my mouth. My right hand has forgotten. This is the brick and mortar of America that murdered Tamir and may stalk the laughter in my back seat. I am a father driving his black sons to school and the death of a black boy ride shotgun and this could be a funeral procession. The death, a silent thing in the air, unmentioned. Because mentioning death invites taboo. If you touch my son, the blood washed away from the concrete must at some point belong to you. And not just to you. To the artifice of justice that is draped like a blue god around your shoulders. The badge that justifies the echo of the fire pistol. Taboo. The thing that says freedom is a murderous body mangled and disrupted by my constitutional rights come to burden. Because the killer's mind refused the narrative of a brown child, his dignity, his right to breathe, his actual fucking existence. With all the crystalline brilliance I saw when my boys first reached for me. This world best invite more than a story of the children bleeding on Chris for days. Tamir's death must be more than warning about recklessness 
and abandoned justice and white terrorist ghosts. And this is why I hate it all. The protests and the encounters, the civil rights attorneys that stalk the bodies of the murdered. This dance of ours that reduces humanity to the dichotomy of the veil. We are not permitted to articulate the reasons we might yearn to see a man die. A mind may abandon sanity. What if all I had stomach for was blood? But history is no sieve. Insanity is no Alexa, and I am bound to be haunted by the strength that lets to me as father, mother, kinfolk resist the temptation to turn everything they see into a grave and make home the series of cells that so many brothers already call their tomb. How to speak to your sons about the fact of violence in the world and our culpability about what happens when men have power in the dark. One of the lines from your poems. Yeah. And I don't know. I mean, you know, like, and that's the thing about the book is it's this doubling. You know, it's like people expect, they, like, you know, they expect to pick up a book called Felon and read this like just complete indictment of the system. <laughs> and, and you know, like the poem Night, that's a poem about domestic violence. Yeah. I read that poem all over the country, right? And I was at this spot earlier today. It was a, it was a, um, a high school for, you know, adult learners. And it was everybody from like 14, man, that got kicked out of school to like 70 years old. And I read this domestic violence poem. And, and like these aren't like poetry people, you know what I mean? These like, few of them poets, but these just like, you know, I'm just trying to get my high school diploma, you know, something happened in school, I ain't finished, whatever. And like I'm reading the poem, and it is the most visceral response I ever had to that poem. It's ooze, it's ours, it's mmm. They hear it, they get it. And what happens is that the, the, I'm reading this poem, and they hearing it, and they not thinking about me, they thinking about the woman that's being abused in the poem. Right. And they got a kind of memory about what the poem is talking about, that it's hit them different than anybody that I ever hit, read that poem to. And, um, and, and, and so that poem about, like, how do I tell my sons about this came out of law school and somebody was doing a, a book called The Feminist Utopia. And I wanted to just write about sexual violence and I wanted to write about, like, what it meant to live in a world where a woman is raped, like, every three minutes. And, um, and, and the poem is, you know, returning to some of these themes about violence and trying to complicate it in a way that acknowledges that this is just not a problem that the state has to own. This is a problem that belongs to us, and it belongs to me. And um, and there's a problem that you know the book doesn't leave you with answers. No, I don't even let my sons read my damn book. You know, it's like it's like they not even. I don't know. I don't even know when I'm gonna be like, yo, Makai. I mean, I don't let Makai read it. Then I walk into his bedroom and the shit is on the floor. So I'm like, <laughs> fuck it. I'm not gonna take it from him. But what it means is he just read something that he knows that we're not going to talk about for five years. Right. Because we don't yet have a language to manufacture what it means to say, like, you live in a society in which, yeah, I remember hearing my, my neighbor, my, my neighbor Bummy, um, mom getting beat up by a boyfriend. I remember, like, being, like, 11, seeing a dude, like, beat the brakes off of this woman, hit her with a bat, and the police come, and the whole scene barely interrupt our football game. And, and it was nobody to talk to about that shit. Right. And so the idea of poetry, I think, is for me to even, like, invite a conversation that's, like, um, troubling and complicated. And to yes. invite it, because if there is some after, then the after must be where we figure out how to deal with that stuff. In If Absence Was the Sound of Silence, you write, I tell my sons about what their hands might do in long conversations about what the hands of men do. That's a very difficult conversation. Yeah. Fortunately, when I wrote it, my kids were like 7 and 11. <laughs> so I didn't tell them. I, so that conversation was like, that was like projecting out into the future. Yeah. But if I say I'm going to have a conversation, then it means I could imagine having it. You right. know, and, like, and I have to because the you're, world is the world. You're in a room of people who care deeply about poetry and the subjects you write about. 
and many of them would like to do something to change the way we approach incarceration and crime and treat prisoners, can you give them yeah, well, I mean, something we didn't, to do? Yeah, I mean, well, we're in D.C., and so this is fundamental questions being asked in D.C. frequently. I mean, they just had the sort of a bill that was allowing defense attorneys to reintroduce cases of clients who got sentenced to 20 years, 15 years, and to say that a judge should look at who they are now and decide if that sentence was actually appropriate. And you had a huge uproar, and, and your paper actually, you know, published, was doing great reporting on it and some not so great reporting on it, making arguments about, um, well, I wouldn't say not so great reporting in the sense that you were just reporting what other people said, but some other people were making arguments that the, sec the look back law was, was inappropriate because it wasn't serving victims well. And the thing was, well, wait, we all live in the same community, and it was just the opportunity to say, well, you've been in prison 10 years, what have you done? Because maybe you have done things while incarcerated to make you an asset to the community, and you shouldn't be there. And if you read the post, then you see that story, and you see what's happening, and then you can write the local legislators. And I think that, like, you know, I mean, D.C.'s not a state, unfortunately. Some of y'all live in Maryland because of that. So, like, you have other powers to write Congress folks and say, like, these are the kind of things that should matter. I mean, mass incarceration is not a subject of conversation in D.C. right now. Um, so, like, you could think about what does it mean to make mass incarceration a subject of conversation. We talk about some stuff like ban the box. Um, you could ask if you Wait, work you for... you explain that phrase. Oh, so ban the box means that when somebody comes in for a job, you can't ask the person about whether or not they've been convicted of a felony. I'm not the, large, the hugest of fans of ban the box, but it's a first step. And the second step would say, well, how do you think about somebody who is convicted of a felony? Like, we only want you to ban the box because we think you are discriminatory, that you will have discriminatory practices, that you will be racist because you not hiring somebody who's convicted of a felony in D.C. means mo mostly that you will avoid hiring young black men. So like having real conversations with people to the degree that you can with your friends who would allow you to have those kind of conversations, I think is meaningful. And then I think also like it is just the depth of knowledge and information about a whole lot of these things. And everybody in this room, I'm assuming, is a reader. You, you, you came out here today, and I appreciate it. You could have done a lot of things with your night. Like, frankly, when I talk about this on Facebook and Twitter, I was more popular than impeachment, and I was more popular than a Democratic debate. And, like, you might not think that's a big deal, but I am going to brag about that to no end, <laughs> you know? Um, and, so, and so I think that this is part of it. And then the other layer to it, too, I think is like, you know, Prison Policy Initiative has great reports. You could just accumulate two or three significant organizations that you care about. You could support their work $10 a month. But also, you could read the reports that they write. And you don't have to read all of them. You read one PPI report a year, and you know more than anybody you, you know, really, about this issue. And then that way, when it comes to opportunity, like you read something in the Post, or you read something in the Times, or you read something in the Gazette, you read something in, the, um, in East of the River paper, like you could actually respond with a letter to an editor. So, I, I mean, I think that fundamentally what it is is, like, we created a huge distance between the people who live in the communities and the people who make decisions about how we should respond to crime. And one thing that we could do is, is, is try to collapse that distance with knowledge and information. And I, and I don't really feel like I'm an anomaly, you know what I mean? I feel like I've been super successful, but I've been successful primarily because there's a lot of people who have been willing to say yes to me despite the fact that I got three felonies. And, and, and some of that is because my felonies occurred when I was really young. But I'll tell you a story. I was on a plane, and I started talking to this woman beside me, and, um, and I ended up telling her I wrote a book. And, and, you know, she said, what's the name of it? And I said, Felon. And she was like, Felon? <laughs> you know? And I was like, nah, just Felon. You know? And she was like, oh, what's that about? And then she was like, can I ask you something? Have you been to prison? <laughs> No, she didn't say that, but, um, but like we started talking and she was like the sweetest woman, you know, she was, she was, um, you know, retired, she was older, she was cool, man, and we just talked and then what happened is in the conversation, we ended up, like she ended up revealing that it was somebody in her life that she was really close to, that she loved, who had dealt with addiction, you know, who had dealt with the things that lead to criminal conviction, who had dealt with like a long-term addiction and had been sober for a number of years. But it was the kind of detail in her life that you could tell that it was some shit that she never said publicly before. That it just felt good for her, be, her, her to be able to say, you know what, 
this person I love dealt with this thing and they figured it out. And I can say this to you because you get it. And, and, and like her saying, I could look at her and, and she was a white woman, right? I could look and tell that she lived in a world that she couldn't admit that to anybody else. I got locked up the first two years. My mom was telling people at her job that I was in college. They was like, you sure must be proud of your son. <laughs> Boy's a genius. You know, so, so I think that if I was given a few tips, I would say those are like the beginning parts of it. And then I guess the most important thing, really, really fundamentally the most important thing is to buy a copy of Felon. <laughs> um, it's an audio book. You can actually get the audio book too. Do you do it? Uh, yeah, I do it. I do the audio book, uh, which is cool because some people say I don't know how to think about poetry. And those same folks listen to music. And you could ask them something like, how many times have you heard Change Gonna Come? Or how many times have you heard some, some song that they don't even like? You know, and they'll say, I, well, I heard that song 50 times. And they'll say the lyrics. And it's like, they won't read a poem 50 times because they don't get that it gives you joy and a different kind of joy when you hear it the second time and the third time. So if you get the Audible book, then, then you get a chance to hear it. And you get a chance to like live with it. And it gets to mean and be different things over time as opposed to you know, this room is, it only gets to be one thing in a moment. And I love what it got to be tonight, but I know that if you read it again and again, it, it'll, it'll reveal other layers of meaning. And I mainly know that's true because in a review, I didn't know, oh, joking. <laughs> <laughs> I want to end by having you read five lines from a poem called What We Know of Horses. It makes a beautiful conclusion to this night. I want, I want to stop and embrace my brother, to hold him close and pause to inhale the scent of prison, to tell him what I smell, what I inhale is still the body of a man. It's been a great night. Thank you very Thank much. You. Great to talk to you. Much as loud. Appreciate it.